Okay, so I'm Andy Cutting and I am the National Autistic Society's Education Rights Lead. Um, my main role is running the NAS School Exclusion Helpline and our remit is to provide information advice for parents and carers of autistic children and young people who've been excluded from school or who are at risk of exclusion. But we also provide information for education professionals um, to try and avoid exclusion in the first place. And that's mainly through online resources, but also through events such as this. So today I'm going to be offering some tips, some hopefully some straightforward tips to try and encourage inclusion and avoid um, exclusion. We're going to be hearing shortly from the young experts panel about some of the difficulties that they faced when they were at school and I'll be talking briefly about some of the impacts of exclusion on autistic children and young people. I'll then be offering up some tips, so the importance of getting to know the individual child or young person, the importance of working with parents and carers, understanding autism and the importance of a genuinely inclusive ethos in any school or college or indeed university. Okay, before we start, all autistic um, people share to a greater or a lesser extent the following um, autistic differences. And I'm using the word differences here um, intentionally because each one of those can be viewed in a positive way, particularly from an autistic point of view. You know, what should it matter if an individual wants to spend time on their own, away from other people, in the quiet, fully engrossed in their, their particular passion, the subject that they're interested in? If we take Chris Packham, for example, he's made a highly successful career out of his special interest of wildlife. Greta Thunberg is now world ambassador in the environment. So my question really is, what is it about school life that can turn these autistic differences into difficulties? Okay, so let's hear now from a few members of our Young Experts panel. I'd compare it to something like, like tunnel vision, yes. in a sense, where it's there is a strong focus. Yeah. Wherever that tunnel vision is, I can see it clearly. Mm -hmm. I can see it in high detail, but everything else around is a blur. Yeah. And if there's things going on in that part that I can't see, it's disorienting and that vision is thrown all over the place. And it, long story short, if you put me in a classroom with a subject I'm interested in, but it's full of racket and full of distraction and full of images and colour. I'm not going to absorb any of the information. Yeah. And I was I was labelled as a as a bad kid in high school because I didn't listen and I didn't mm. take in information or write down notes. And that's because I you couldn't, couldn't hear. It. Teachers need to take everything into account because for me, if even if I wanted to attend the class and knew what was happening in the class, if the classroom was too bright or too noisy and it was causing meltdowns and shutdowns, then it there's no progress that's going to be made and it does need to be adapted um, to support that young person. Um, particularly when being told I've got to do group activities, it was something that I personally really struggled with, with the amount of noise that was in the classroom space with all the different groups talking and... Okay and being forced to work with other people that I didn't necessarily get on with and I struggled to share my ideas so I was being told that I wasn't putting enough effort in because it was just a situation that was too stressful for me. The bad experience is um, I got bullied at school and I wandered off in the corridors. I, I tried to look for a staff but there was no one around and I got stuck alone in the corridor. I felt very sad and disappointed in myself. They could have shown me what to do, or they could have they could have come out of the corridor and seen me then, what's wrong and what happened. Are you okay and how are you feeling? Okay, the difficulties that were described so eloquently there can build up over the course of a day or a week or a term until they become absolutely overwhelming. And then for some autistic children, young people, that then manifests itself in what we call distress behaviour. And that can be lashing out verbally or physically, biting, scratching, throwing furniture and so on, kicking and so on. But of course, a head teacher's um, first response to an incident like that 
if someone is hurt, is perhaps to exclude that young person. But I always feel that for an autistic child or young person who already feels that they don't really fit into school life, perhaps they have few or no friends in the school at all, to have a letter written by the head teacher to their parents saying, you are excluded for five days, must, I would imagine, feel like an official notification, you are not welcome at our school. And this can have a catastrophic effect on a young person and lead to the negative feelings that I've described on the screen there. In schools, we talk about all behaviour being a choice. And I would agree with that. For most of the children, most of the time, I think that's true. But for an autistic child, when they are completely overwhelmed, um, they have very little choice over their actions, I would argue. So we always suggest to teachers um, and other teaching staff to view any incident through the, through the lens of that child's autism. Don't judge it from, an, auti from a, an adult point of view. What's it like for that child? What's it like for them walking through the school gates in the morning? What's it like for them walking across the playground and navigating that social, social and sensory world and walking into a busy, noisy classroom? So for an autistic child, when they're overwhelmed, their choices can be limited to these. So flight is running out of the classroom. It's running into a far corner of the playground. Climbing a tree is very common. Climbing over a fence, trying to run home. And if they can't do that, they'll often hide. Hiding under a table, locking themselves in the toilets, for example. The fight response is sometimes triggered when um, staff with uh, good intentions, of course, use physical restraint, for example, on a child. And that child with that, the close proximity of people around them may be asking questions, they can then lash out. And then freeze is perhaps less noticeable, but that's where the child shuts down. They're not able to answer any questions, um, they're disengaged from their education, but they're just sitting there um, without any involvement at all. This is a diagram that I often like to share. So it shows a, an iceberg, and at the tip of the iceberg, it's the bit that you can see above water level. And that is the distress behaviour, the, the lashing out, the biting, the scratching and so on. But below the water level are all those difficulties that that young person faces which are a direct consequence of their autism. And it's only when a school is able to identify what they are and then put in place the necessary reasonable adjustments and strategies that the likelihood of the more challenging type of behaviour is going to be reduced. Plus, I'll just read this to you, if you can't see from the back. But this was from a grandparent who contacted us once and gave us permission to share this. The school have painted Oscar as some sort of a monster. Instead of my grandson, who sleeps with three teddies, is scared of the dark and doesn't eat anything with a face on. And for me, this absolutely sums up what exclusion can do. It can fracture the relationship between schools and families and they can go off in completely different directions. The family sees that child as a unique, vulnerable young person who's got so many special qualities. And a school, some schools, can see the child as a problem to be removed. So part of my role is to try and bring those two parties back together to work together in the best interests of the child. So tip number one, and I don't, I'm not saying that anything's very revolutionary here, it's very, hopefully fairly um, obvious, but get to know the individual. Listen to the voice of the autistic child or young person. And I don't mean just literally listening, also observing their behaviour. What situations do they really enjoy? Which situations do they find uncomfortable and difficult and cause stress? Enable them to contribute to and influence decisions. And use a range of strategies to get to know the autistic child or young person and find out about their particular profile of strengths, challenges, interests and aspirations. If I give you a quick example there. A few years ago I was tutoring maths um, to an autistic boy and he wasn't really engaged. Um, but he kept on telling me about James Bond. So I went out to the shops and I bought a pack of those top trump cards you can get, I don't know if you've seen them, about sort of 50 cards with pictures of James Bond characters on them. And underneath they have all these facts about James Bond. Um, some of which were numerical. So I was able to use those to do rounding of numbers, place value, adding and subtracting two-digit numbers. And he became really engaged in maths all of a sudden and, did, you know, did really well. And I learnt a lot about James Bond. 
Okay, we're going to hear now from um, Aidan about the importance of listening to autistic children and young people. I think that across all scenarios where someone would get excluded or suspended, etc., a big part of the way I think teachers could handle those situations better, so they might not need to happen, is to, you know, ask the person for their point of view and not dismiss it uh, if they do share it. Um, because I guess there will obviously be autistic people who have, you know, disclosed what actually happened and they've been dismissed, and that just means they're not going to disclose it in the future. So I guess also being aware that, especially if someone has been excluded from school before, has been bullied, etc., just because they're not willing to disclose doesn't mean that, like, whatever's happened is their fault. It might be that they think that if they actually share it, um, you're actually going to punish them for that more. One of the characteristics of autism is a strong sense of justice. And I think if young people feel they're not being listened to, um, they'll sometimes take the law into their own hands and become like little vig vigilantes. Uh, and if they feel they're being bullied, they may then seek revenge. OK, my next tip is to ask an expert. And by an expert, here I'm talking about parents, because there is nobody on planet Earth who knows a child better than their own parents. And it's not just me who is saying that. The Code of Practice, which is a guide to the legislation around special education needs and disability, it says that parents know their child best. It goes on to say that discussions with school are an opportunity for the parent to share their concerns and together with the teacher, agree their aspirations for the pupil. It says that schools should enable parents to share their knowledge about their child and give them confidence that their views and contributions are valued and will be acted upon. And it acknowledges that sometimes these discussions can be challenging, but it's in the child's best interest for a positive dialogue between parents, teachers and others. OK, that's all very well, but how do you achieve that in practice? Well, here's a guide that uh, Dean had up on the screen earlier on, which I just want to talk about for a minute, from the Autism Education Trust, working together with your child's school. And it's aimed, this one's aimed at parents. Uh, it's got lots of little tips in there about building or rebuilding a positive relationship with a school, but most of it is taken up as a, like a questionnaire. There are 36 statements in there about a child's autism needs, and the idea is that as a family, you go through each one and you decide how relevant it is to your child. So, for example, on the left there, probably sort of top of the charts in terms of reasonable adjustments for an autistic child. Your child has a safe and quiet place to go within the classroom or school when needed. And the idea is that when you've been through all 36, rather than taking in 36 demands into the school, the guide suggests just pick three. Three priorities um, and then arrange a meeting with the SENCO, class teacher or form teacher. And there's two things that I like about this guide. First of all, it's positive. You're going into school with solutions and ideas. You're not going in all guns blazing, saying you failed to do this, you said you were going to do that, and you haven't. The second, second thing I like about it is that when families look through the guide, they're likely to spot some things that they do intuitively. And so this guide allows them to get those views across in a sort of semi-formal and structured way. This is another one of the AET's guides. This one is aimed at teachers. Um, positive relationships between home and school. Nice and brief, but some really good, positive, clear messages um, for all schools. Here are a couple of more guides that I really like. I always recommend these. Whole school, from the Whole School Send, the one on the left there, Guide to Making Conversations Count. Uh, sorry, make Conversations with Schools Count for All Families. Both of those are like little leaflets that you can open out sort of in a sort of concertina kind of way. Um, the way that they, they're useful, I think, is that sometimes when parents go into meetings with school, they don't really know what to say. They, you know, they don't know what to ask. But both of these le leaflets, the one on the right is Understanding SEN Support, both of these leaflets have, you know, like 30 or 50 questions, which are really kind of probing, probing questions to ask a school. So for example, how do you analyse incidents of challenging behaviour and understand why they happen? And maybe the iceberg diagram might be useful for that as well. 
How will you prevent my child from feeling different as a result of the support you're providing? I think that's particularly relevant at secondary school, when autistic children are going through puberty. They may not feel it's very cool to have a, a teaching assistant sort of sitting right next to them. So what are you going to do to make them uh, feel less conscious, self-conscious? What systems do you have in place to ensure that all staff understand my child's requirements? So an example there would be an autistic child going to a history lesson and the history teacher really gets autism and that they've got a really good relationship, a great rapport with the child and they almost instinctively make reasonable adjustments for that young person and they put in place the agreed strategies. That same child then goes into, let's say, a geography lesson and maybe the geography teacher doesn't have quite the same understanding of autism, perhaps is a little dismissive of some of the strategies. That means that that child, might, their behaviour might then become disruptive and that of course could lead to exclusion. How can you support my child's social development as well as their subject-based learning? There is so much emphasis on academic achievement and progress. But what about the autistic child who is sitting for the first time for five minutes on the carpet listening to a story or has for the first time been engaged in a little group discussion about something? How are you going to measure that? Right, my next tip is about understanding autism. Perhaps I should add in there uh, empathy as well, empathising as well. The AET provides training for teachers via um, training hubs all across England. On the screen you can see three of their training options, but there are many, many more. Um, if you have any questions about those, you can either go to the AET stand, which is kind of in the middle on the right-ish slightly, um, or have a look on the AT's um, website. The AT also produced lots of uh, resources for teachers. So on the left here we have a Senko's guide to supporting learners on the autism spectrum, written by a very experienced Senko. On the right there, guidance for school leaders on supporting autistic members of staff. So what reasonable, what reasonable adjustments might an autistic teacher need to do their job? Promoting autism-inclusive attitudes. Um, it's, it's, it's great if teachers have a good understanding of autism, but what about all the children? Um, this is about raising peer awareness. Supporting learners with autism during transition. So through the huge changes in any autistic uh, child's life, so the, the early years to primary, from primary to secondary school. OK, so the statutory guidance on exclusion, which is the guide to the legislation around exclusion, for me, the standout sentence in the whole of that document is that disruptive behaviour can be an indication of unmet needs. Now, one of my colleagues has written this guide, which is steps to avoid the exclusion of autistic pupils. It's for teachers, uh, also useful for parents as well, I think. Uh, nice and not too long, not too daunting. And it's got um, the following sections. I'm not going to go through those sections now, but I, do, I would urge you to have a look at that straightforward guide. OK, moving on to overcoming barriers to inclusion. The statutory guidance on exclusion that I mentioned, it says, I'm not going to read all of that, but it says, under the Equality Act, if I skip to the last sentence there, for disabled children, this includes a duty to make reasonable adjustments to policies and practices and the provision of auxiliary aids. So the Department for Education are highlighting policies there. So in other words, in terms of exclusion, we're talking about the behaviour policy. This means that schools can be flexible. So rather than having a, a blanket, zero tolerance, we've got to treat everybody the same approach, they can be flexible and explore other options. So for example, rather than excluding an autistic child, maybe they have a morning out of class working on a social story so they understand how we line up for assembly or whatever it might be. The DfE is, has produced a revised version of the guidance which is likely to come into force in September or possibly January, I'm not quite sure yet. But in there, um, they say that the duty to make reasonable adjustments can in principle apply both to the suspensions and permanent exclusion process and to the disciplinary sanctions imposed. So in fact, they're making it even more explicit really there. Um, here, if I skip down to the last sentence there, it says, uh, if reasonable adjustments have not been made for a pupil with a disability, 
that can manifest itself in breaches of school rules, if needs are not met, a decision to exclude may be discriminatory. Now that is a clear reference to the upper tribunal decision back in 2018, which the NES was involved in, and it looked at what was then called the tendency to physical abuse of others. Because before that time, if an autistic child had been violent, a claim of disability discrimination would be likely to be thrown out. Uh, but since that time, that is no longer the case, and schools now must make sure that they've made reasonable adjustments before they resort to exclusion. OK, let's just hear now from some of the young experts about the importance of making reasonable adjustments. So for me, it was really important that adaptations were made and the right ones in order to try and get back into mainstream school. It was something that I was absolutely terrified of, but I knew that with the right support and changes that it could work. And this meant things such as having a teaching assistant in my lessons help prescribe what the teacher was saying, having the lessons printed off beforehand, having um, adjustments in exams, so things like extra time, being in my own room so that things didn't distract me, like noises or lights or anything like that. And with all these in place, it was then possible for me to actually achieve that and go back into lessons and actually learn. Autism in education to me means being able to write a 5,000 word essay in a quiet room with my stim toys, mm. but not even being able to write one sentence in a noisy, crowded, colourful classroom. My needs are different and when they're met I excel and when they're not I struggle. We are all entitled to learn and achieve. I think one point to make there is that, you know, most reasonable adjustments just involve a a sort of change in practice. They don't need, you know, huge amounts of money pumped into them. Basically, it requires creative problem solving, and that's what teachers do best. Okay, and then finally, uh, the importance of an inclusive ethos. I've got a couple of quotes here from teachers, which I picked up some years ago now. Um, it's our problem, we solve problems. Any problem solved by a child means that we haven't got something right. And I really like that because sometimes when we're talking about behaviour that's causing concern, it's often there's a lot of emphasis on the child as being the problem. But I think in great schools, they, it's, it's about reflective practice. You know, what, what do we need to change about what we're doing at the moment to help that young person feel settled? And also, we don't do this because we're, although we're not, sorry, <laughs> we don't do this because we're nice people, although we are. We do it because kids who feel part of the school learn better. OK, let's hear just a bit more from uh, Aidan. I guess the final thing is something that I've read a lot on like autistic Twitter. I don't think I've ever met or seen an account of school from any autistic people who went to mainstream schools that doesn't seem to have led to some level of like trauma, bullying, school exclusion, etc. So I think that if, if mainstream schools say that they actually do want disabled students, it's not just good enough to have us there. There actually need to be more measures taken to make sure that we don't have these experiences because that doesn't actually, that actually just hurts us later on in life. Okay, I think an inclusive eth ethos has to come from the head teacher, but it needs to permeate through all members of the school community. So teachers, obviously, lunchtime supervisors, governors, children uh, and parents as well. OK, a couple more quotes from teachers here to, to sort of round up. There's no quick fix or a one size fits all set of strategies. There's no autism manual you can take off the shelf and say, this is what we do for all autistic children. So choose ways that the child is likely to enjoy and also that the staff will enjoy so that the school's a good place to be, or to be for all. And that's a, that's a key thing. There's no point choosing something that uh, everyone's sort of dreading doing. Um, everyone's got to be enjo enjoying doing it. Get to know the child. Don't worry about the range of interventions. It's about how the people around the child behave. So if they're feeling calm and enjoying things, then that may well rub off on the autistic child as well. So I started off the talk by talking about some of the negative impacts of exclusion. But when um, an autistic child is listened to 
and their parents are involved and there is a good understanding and empathy um, of autism and uh, reasonable adjustments are made and strategies made to overcome those barriers to inclusion, then an autistic child can, su can succeed at school. They can feel included and, th and that is then a springboard into later life where I would argue their future life chances are massively increased.